Today we are continuing from where we left off the last time. We stopped at chapter 2, Sankhya Yoga. We stopped at verse 4. Just to quickly recap, chapter 2 is a very important chapter. It is the essence of the entire Bhagavad Gita. It contains the core of the teachings. When we stopped at chapter 4, we left off with um, with Arjun saying, how can I fight my teachers, Bhishma and Rona? They are worthy of honor and respect. And we talked about the fact that though they are his teachers and worthy of respect, there is a difference between blind faith and reasoned faith that we should listen to our inner wisdom, our conscience, the guru within, and the guru within, or the, the guru outside, the external guru, the job of that external guru is leading you to the guru within. When you are in touch with the guru within, then you do not need the guru outside. We continue with verse 5, and it says, It is indeed better in this world to live by begging than to kill the gurus of great stature. By killing my gurus, I would be attaining only worldly, blood-smeared pleasures and gains, and ignoring righteousness and liberation. Arjun is continuing to present further arguments why he should not fight. In chapter 1, you may recall we spoke about this in detail, that Arjun presented many arguments, very convincing, very logical arguments. He mentioned the role of lineages and traditions. He mentioned society, the importance of preserving society and values, ethics, etc., knowledge. And that's why he is producing, he is, he is coming up with further arguments why he should not continue to fight. And now he has come up with a really very good argument, and that is that I cannot kill my gurus. By killing my gurus, I will be committing a great sin. I will only gain blood-smeared pleasures. And of course, this is a very strong argument. All the same, you can see that these are further reasons to convince himself that he should not fight. How can we explain this? Certainly, gurus are worthy of respect and honor. Yet, at the same time, it is the internal guru that supersedes the external guru. The external guru only leads you to the guru within. And it is the guru within that should direct you in all matters. It may be simple things, it can be very important things. When Guru within, when Buddhi guides you, then it may seem sometimes to certain people from outside to be not right because we have certain ideas in society. We are attached to certain ideas and when we start following the voice of wisdom within, it may sound radical, it may sound revolutionary, it may sound against all 
conventions and ideas that you're grown up with or you're brought up with. In certain societies, for example, it is considered totally right that certain parts of the society are not treated well. So in certain countries, women are not given the same rights. In certain countries, people of different classes or status in society are not given the same rights as others. And this is completely normal. So strong is this upbringing that these ideas are so deeply ingrained in us that going against these ideas is very difficult. And yet, we know that it is not right to suppress certain parts of society. We know that women should have equal rights. And yet, if you are coming from that society and you're raised with these ideas, it seems totally normal. So it may happen that when you start listening to the voice of buddhi, the ego, ahankara, that has been trained in a certain way, has been hypnotized by certain ideas. And these ideas have become thinking habit patterns, behavioral habit patterns are so deeply ingrained in us that they seem to become a part of our nature. It is not our true nature. Our true nature is pure consciousness. But it has usurped that role. And we think that this is our true nature. And then the voice of Buddhi becomes very strong. Initially, this sounds, it seems to be wrong almost. But there is a part of you that knows it's right. It's struggling. And that battle continues. So here again, he is struggling. There's a part of him that knows that he has to fight even his gurus. He has to go beyond that. In Zen Buddhism, there's a very interesting phenomenon that takes place. When a student becomes enlightened, in Zen Buddhism that state is called Satori, when the student gets enlightened, he goes and hits his master on the head. It is a sign to say, I am enlightened now, I don't need you. Your job is done. For example, when you need to cross the river, you need a boat. Once you have crossed, you don't need the boat anymore. And so it is on this journey, when you have crossed over with the help of your guide, reached the other shore, now you have your internal buddhi, your internal wisdom guiding you. You don't need the external teacher. And we start the process of unlearning habit patterns, unlearning conventions, unlearning social norms. And that is one of the reasons why very often these teachings are not given to everyone. We say nadatavyam, nadatavyam, nadatavyam. Don't impart, don't impart, don't impart. Because an impure mind, a student that's not prepared and is impure, can very conveniently understand this to mean whatever he wants it to mean. He can say, I'm enlightened, I can do what I want. That is a great danger. Here it is to be taken in the sense of a student that has developed to an extent and has to learn to go beyond the external means. At some point of time, 
in life on the path of meditation as you get to know yourself more and more you will find that nothing external can help you anymore the only guide you have then is buddhi so anybody would like to ask anything to this particular verse I have something here. Yes, Krishna. Hi. Word. Hi. So, uh, you mentioned uh, well, these students who, uh, you know, who are not ready to be imparted, but then they come up, come back and say, "I'm enlightened. I can do anything." Yes. Is it? It somehow doesn't sound right that they are enlightened. It should be an illusion, right? That they are probably in a middle state, and because I just assume that if you're truly enlightened, you would know responsible. Yeah. Clearly. Yes. Hello? Yeah, yes, of course. I, I think that was a yeah. s- small little uh, echo or something, a little technical thing. Yes, you are absolutely right. Um, if the mind is impure uh, and not enlightened, uh, you're just claiming that. There is a part of you that knows that. But of course, you know, we have seen this all the time, even in our modern busy lives. whatever profession you may be in whatever it is you do it whether it's as a homemaker or in the world outside you might find that there are people who claim to know a lot of things but don't know really maybe everybody has met somebody like that you know somebody who claims to be an expert in something and then you find out that that person is actually not an expert but if you if you examine this person you might just find that he doesn't think he's lying he is genuinely believes that he is an expert you know sometimes we convince ourselves that we are experts in certain things so it can happen that an impure mind really believes that he is an advanced student or an adept and that is why the great danger and that is why we say don't impart don't impart don't impart yeah that makes sense hmm? yeah so you know yeah. most of the people who read the bhagavad gita have read commentaries that have approached the bhagavad gita from the perspective of karma yoga and the reason for that is that these commentaries have been written by people like mahatma gandhi vinoba bhave uh, even other teachers scholars who have written it have written it from such a perspective you know a scholarly perspective so we have over the years most people who have read the bhagavad gita only read the bhagavad gita from this perspective you know from karma yoga perspective but the bhagavad gita has very very strong tantric background i have mentioned that it is actually sort of the essence of the upanishads a lot of people would say oh but there is no tantra in the vedas that's not true there is very much tantra in the vedas but it is hidden those who practice recognize it those who don't practice do not recognize it because the tantric part was always kept secret now there are lots and lots of books all over the place about tantra and so you say oh the tantric books are different and the books you know the vedic books are different but earlier the tantric teachings were veiled they were concealed they were veiled and these teachings also are there in the vedas only we don't recognize it and the teachings of the bhagavad gita therefore have a very strong tantric strain in it and so we say nada tabyam nada tabyam nada tabyam don't impart don't impart don't impart because students that are not prepared students that don't even want to grow or evolve they're just merely curious you know some students they want to know a lot of things but they're not quite ready to practice anything so these kind of students 
cannot attain anything and this kind of knowledge cannot be shared with them. Okay? So. Yeah, okay, thanks. So, verse 6. Once again, Arjun says, Nor do we know which one of us is the more powerful, whether we would win or whether we, they would win over us. Those whom, upon killing, we would have no desire to continue living, the very sons of Dhritarashtra standing before us in prominence. So, still another argument, which uh, is an argument against fighting, an argument in favor of giving up even before he starts the battle. Arjun very clearly doubts himself. He is not even sure if he can win. And indeed, that is true. If you are not convinced, if you are not clear, if your mind is divided, if your heart is not in the matter, then you know you cannot be successful in anything. All of you have done something in life where you may not have been fully in it. You know, your heart was not in it, you did it half-heartedly and quite sure that that project or that uh, whatever it was that you were doing did not work out. And you know it did not work out because you were not fully in it. And we see that when we take our effort, we're really involved, we, we put all our energy into something, we're very focused, very clear, then we are successful. But here, because his mind is not in it, his heart is not in it, he has many doubts, chances are very high then that he would not win. And then he says, by killing the sons of the Tarashtra, we would not be able to live anymore. And so he's, his attachments have, have come up, have surfaced. What are the attachments here? Who are the sons of the Tarashtra? Why are they called your sons of the Tarashtra and not Kauravas? The Tarashtra, the blind king, is symbolic for ignorance. So what are the sons of ignorance? Sons of ignorance are ignorant things like pride, greed, anger, fear, aversion, attachment, egoism. All these are the sons of ignorance. All these are what comes out of our own ignorance. So if we do not wish to destroy these in ourselves, if we do not wish to work with these, attenuate these negative qualities, these negative glaciers, then what that means is you remain in a state of ignorance. The veil of avidya is so heavy and so dark upon Arjun at this point of time. He is afraid, he is full of doubt, he is full of attachment. And this is all a form of egoism, in fact. Such a person, of course, would find it very difficult to work in meditation to transform oneself because it requires a great deal of courage to face these negative qualities in ourselves. So would anybody like to uh, ask anything about this? Or we can move to the next one. Okay, so let's move to the next one. So Arjun says, my true nature 
subdued by the fault of miserableness, my mind deluded as to the righteous conduct, I ask you, whatever is definitely better, do tell me that. I am your disciple, surrendering to you. Do teach me and guide me. I do not see anything that might remove this grief that is drying up my senses. Not even a prosperous kingdom without enemies, nor sovereignty over the gods. So Arjun has at least, even in these moments of doubt, self-condemnation, turmoil, despondency, a complete depression, and the darkness covered by the darkness of Avidya, in spite of that, there is a little shimmering light of awareness in him, self-awareness. He is aware that his mind is deluded. He doesn't know what is the right conduct. He doesn't know what is right, what is better. And he asks Shri Krishna, tell me, tell me what is better. Tell me what I should do. Teach me. Guide me. I am your disciple. That is a very important quality. For any good student, we need a certain amount of self-awareness. Without this self-awareness, you would not recognize that you need guidance. This little bit of self-awareness means that the ego is still not so strong, not so powerful, the ego does not have a con complete grasp over him. There is enough self-awareness there to see that he is deluded. So you can see again here his mind is divided. There is a part that is trying to argue logically to convince himself that he should surrender and not fight this battle. Yet there's a part that says, I'm confused. I don't know what to do. Guide me. As long as we have that self-awareness, there is hope for us. If we don't have any self-awareness, then... You are truly evil, because that's what evil means, that the dark forces of the mind, the negative qualities are so strong that buddhi is not heard at all, that there's no self-awareness at all. There's no checking point, you know, there's no, no, nothing to, to keep track and check on you, are you doing the right thing? In a society or in a country where a dictator takes over, there are no more checks to control the actions of this person. And then the power corrupts that one person completely. And so it is here. If there are no, there's no system that checks on all these qualities, then the evil qualities or the negative qualities simply take over. But Arjun has that in him. He has that self-awareness. This self-awareness tells him, I don't know. Teach me. Another important quality, he says, I am surrendering to you. Teach me, guide me. So he has also the humility to admit as well as ask for help. Self-awareness is of little use if we still have a very strong pride or ego which does not allow us to ask for help. So Arjun that is why he is such a great warrior. That is why he's the ideal student. He has the self-awareness and he has the humility. He has both these qualities. At the moment, his life seems so dark, he says, Everything seems to... Grief is drying up my senses. We might have experienced that sometime when you're in, in a... when you lose a dear one. 
you know, you're so troubled. It's such grief that comes upon you that nothing can make you happy. Nothing can cheer you up. What will you do with a kingdom if you have lost a very person very dear to you? What will you do with sovereignty over gods? And so he is so deeply attached to all these things that he is not able to see at the moment that there is something beyond that. So Arjun is still divided, his mind is still divided, but there is hope because there is self-awareness, there is the light of self-awareness shining in him. Can we continue or is anybody wants to ask anything? Else? Where is Ashish today? Ashish is very quiet. <laughs> Just listening today. <laughs> In the listening mode today. Yeah. Um, I have to always be on my toes when you ask these questions, so I was wondering whether... <laughs> so, <clears throat> Sanjay says, Sanjay who is the narrator of the Bhagavad Gita, Sanjay says, Arjun, the master of sleep, a scorcher of enemies, having uttered this to Krishna, Lord of the senses, again addressed Govinda, another name for Krishna, saying, I shall not fight, and then lapsed in, into silence. So once again, uh, these qualities are mentioned, the quality of Arjun being the master of sleep, and Krishna, lord of senses. We have already discussed this uh, in one of the earlier sessions, so we shall not go into that again. But um, here... What is interesting is that Arjun, having said, guide me, in the earlier verses, I am surrendering to, to you, guide me, teach me. And now he says, I shall not fight. Now, to me that sounds like conflicting statements. On one hand, he says, Tell me what I should do. And on the other hand, he has already made up his mind. He's not exactly very open, is he? He claims he is ready for instructions. But then he says, okay, but I'm not going to fight. What is this that happens to a seeker, to a student? When the student comes to the teacher and says, Oh, Guruji or oh, teacher, please teach me. And the teacher says, Okay, then uh, change your food habits. Oh, no, no, teach me, but I'm not changing my food habits. I love the things I eat, you know. I love eating greasy, oily food. I love sweets, ice creams, chocolates. And I'm not going to change that. I'm going to continue to have coffee alcohol and but just tell me what I should do and you know <laughs> this really happens we want to have the highest teachings but we don't want to start from scratch so we want to have esoteric teachings and we listen it's very comforting it's it's, it's really wonderful to hear these beautiful uh, teachings of the Upanishads, of the Bhagavad Gita. But then when it comes down to making concrete changes in our life, then we find out that we are not exactly surrendering, are we? So Arjun is not exactly quite surrendering. It seems that his surrender is almost conditional. Yes, I'll do what you want me to do, provided you tell me 
exactly what I want to hear. And that is how a lot of students are. It's not just, you know, some. It's with everybody. And the reason for that is that we have been raised in a certain way, are bringing in all societies, irrespective of which society you come from, is the same. They have been raised in a certain way. And that is after a certain point of time when you're adult, you're grown up, you think, I'm a grown up, I know what to do. And so you're not quite willing to make changes. And so it was also with Arjun. He said first something, but then through his actions, you see that he is still not quite ready. So there are levels of students. You can say that Arjun is prepared. He is quite an advanced student, but he's not an adept. And he's definitely not a siddha. He's not a perfect one. So he's still on the path and he still needs to change, transform and get a deeper understanding of things, integrate these in his life. And one of the things he needs to learn is learn to listen. Learn to listen to his buddhi. Learn to listen to his guide. So we can move on to the next one if there is no comment Before on this. Before you move on, could you co uh, comment on the, the Master of Sleep? Master of that's Sleep. Not in every, that's not in every translation. Some translations don't have that. Yes, yes. Uh, if you see the original Sanskrit, then you will see uh, Master of Sleep is Gudakesh. Gudakesh is Conqueror of Sleep or Master of Sleep. So it depends on the translation. Also, some of the words, um, I, I've mentioned before that Sanskrit is one of these very unusual languages where one word can have actually 40 meanings or so, such as the word guru, which means pregnant woman, as well as uh, planet Jupiter and gravity and teacher. So, similarly, there are many different translations then opt for different versions. Here... Um, the translator Pandit Arya has opted for Arjun, uh, who has been called Gudakesh as conqueror of sleep. Who is the master of sleep? The one who has already attained certain mastery in yoga. Master of sleep means you have attained the state of at least yoga nidra, where you have had a glimpse of the self. Not for very long perhaps, but a glimpse. You cannot hold on to it, to it, you are not established in it, but you have attained that state where you are aware of yourself in the deep sleep state. And that means that the person is, is, uh, has, an, has attained something and he is ready for these kind of teachings. And it calls them like a, a, a chastiser or a scorcher of enemies. So that's the, the enemies of ignorance and yes. the other yeah. bad qualities. So yeah. he's saying he's somebody that's he has a little bit of insight. He's he knows he's familiar with his ignorance to some degree. Yeah. But basically, he's still not ready to completely uh, acknowledge Krishna's wisdom. Yes. Yes. Primarily because the wisdom implies taking on these negative qualities, um, you know, in a big, big way. So far, his preparation had been perhaps more at an external level. And I mentioned, for example, uh, eating habits, you know, in a, just to make it very practical. Uh, and we can make these kind of changes. We can integrate practices in our lives, etc. And so that kind of preparation we all can do to a certain extent. But now we're talking about taking on these negative qualities, looking at ourselves, being aware, sitting in meditation, witnessing, 
This is quite a different level of mastery. And taking on that is quite a challenge. And for that, he still needs a little bit more time. He needs to mature further. But he's getting there because he, he recognizes that he is, he is um, faltering, that he is about to be defeated if he does not continue down this path he will lose the battle. In our terms, it would mean that if we do not proceed in our meditation and take it to right to the end, we could get stuck somewhere. It doesn't mean that we're going backwards, but getting stuck can be perceived as something terrible by someone who is very sensitive the yogi experiences everything as pain. His mind is as sensitive as the eyeball, the Yoga Sutras 2.15. And so, for such a yogi to be stuck and not to progress is as good as losing a battle. He's lost. And so he's still at that point where he's faltering. He, he doesn't know... He, he's seeing the battle ahead of him. He sees all these negative qualities and he says, I don't think I can do this. This is, I'm not such a great warrior after all. Look at those guys there. They're much bigger than me. And he needs that encouragement. And he needs some time to mature to understand what he's getting into. Clashes are just too overwhelming. Yes, they are far too strong. When we fall into them, we are totally lost. We lose our detachment. We lose our self-awareness. When you experience great anger at somebody, for example, you say all sorts of things that you possibly don't even mean very often, but you completely lose control because you've completely fallen into that klesha. You've lost your self-awareness. Or when somebody very dear to you dies, you know, the loss of this person is so overwhelming, so tragic, that the sadness completely overtakes you. You completely lose your balance. And under the circumstances, you're, you're not able to proceed. And so in meditation, when such glaciers start coming forward, it may include... Memories from the deep past can include very painful memories and aspects of yourself. And of course, uh, the bravest of warriors would falter when they see, see these in themselves. You know, it's the ultimate uh, battle. And that is also why all the great spiritual stories that have been told throughout the world in all traditions have always been stories of, of good triumphs over evil. There's always this, these dualities. And these dualities always represent the dualities in the mind. Okay, we can continue. So, number 10, verse number 10. To him who was sad, O descendant of Bharata, there between the two armies, the lord of the senses said these words, smiling at him. So, Arjun and Krishna are standing between both the armies. On one side, the negative qualities on the other side, the positive qualities. Arjun, the seeker, 
standing there looking at both sides has some self-awareness. He's beginning to let go, he's, he's beginning to see things and so he sees both the qualities in himself and that is why he's sad because he sees all that he needs to do as well as that, that there is this part in him. There is self-condemnation, there is sadness. And the Lord of the senses, that one who has mastery of the senses, smiles and speaks to him. When we experience this inner battle, our only guide is Buddhi. The external teacher, the teacher without, can only help to a certain extent. Finally, you have to fight your own battle. The teacher can accompany you, but cannot fight your battles for you. So that is why also we see that in the battle, Krishna is merely his charioteer. Krishna does not fight the battle for Arjun. He guides him, but he does not fight his battles for him. And so Arjun is standing there looking at this and he knows that the only one who can help him now is his own buddhi, the teacher within. So the question is, buddhi is there, buddhi is talking, but Are you listening? That is one of the biggest issues that a seeker faces. That the seeker, the meditator, has not spent enough time in sharpening his own buddhi. The mind is still so impure that you cannot even hear the voice of wisdom. Imagine you are in a class, you know, when you were young, you were in a classroom, there were all these kids shouting and screaming, and a very strong teacher came in, and the moment the strong teacher said silence, everybody was quiet. But now, think of the teacher who was not so strong, you know, how kids can be and they can give some teachers a hard time and so there's a class of really naughty kids and they're throwing paper rockets at each other and uh, making a hell of a racket. Teacher says silence, 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 but nobody's listening. And so if you have an impure mind, that is exactly how your mind is. There are all sorts of voices in there, shouting loud. Nobody's listening to the teacher. Nobody listens to Buddhi. But if the class is disciplined, teacher is strong, then you have order. Then you can learn something. And so it is with the mind. If your mind is not orderly, it's not disciplined, it's very impure. And impure means... Ahankara is very strong. A lot of strong thinking patterns, habit patterns, which are unhealthy. Manas has still not been trained. It is attracted to all sorts of sensory objects around you. Chitta, the memory bank, has got a lot of memories stored in there that may be very painful to you and that you don't want to look at. But these keep coming up, bubbling up. And because of these extreme conflicts, which are in the mind and not resolved, there can be a state of dis-ease, causing disease. This lack of ease causes disease. And so, such a person is not listening to buddhi. So for us, we need to ask ourselves, are you listening to buddhi? Are you listening to your teacher? Even 
in this case your external teacher, if your mind has not been purified, if you haven't done that work, then you will not be able to listen to the voice of Buddhi. In that case, until the time you are strong enough, you need the guidance of an external teacher, one who has been on this path before, one who has a sharp buddhi, who has access to the guru within, one who has been on this path and has attenuated or burnt up his or her own negative qualities, such as pride, greed, anger, attachment, aversion, fear, desires of all kinds, and such a teacher can help you. But the key is to listen. Most of the times we are not listening. We are having monologues, not only with others, but also with ourselves. So we need to learn to get into a dialogue. To get in a dialogue with people around us, with our teachers. Listen to what they're saying, as well as get into a dialogue with your own mind and develop a relationship with it. Is there, do you think there's also a sense about this passage that when we find ourselves despondent over the, the fight in ourselves, you know, um, that we, we, we need to try to connect to a sense of joy Within us, like when he said, the Lord of the senses said these words smiling at him, we need to remember the Satcha Ananda of Atman. Mm. My only concern with that is that when we talk about Atman and Satcha and connecting to the joy within, it can very quickly become an intellectual kind of, uh, you know, more theoretical idea than a practical one. Mm. I always try to be very practical, keep my instructions very simple. So I always recommend having the internal dialogue with the mind, in which you have a conversation, literally, with your mind. As children, we were all able to do it very well. You know, as children, we all kind of Miss Wibber may be playing with some little toy or something and having a little conversation with ourselves. And that is very therapeutic. But as we grow up, you know, an elder sibling might have laughed at us or somebody said, oh, how sweet, you're talking to yourself. You know, and that's, that was it. That was the last time you ever had a conversation with yourself. But now that one is more aware and more conscious and as a grown-up. You can do this again. It's a beautiful, very therapeutic practice and it's the most ancient practice in the world. It is called Atma Vichara and it comes from the Vedas, from the Upanishads. It was not invented by Raman Maharishi or anybody else. Uh, a lot of people think that it was, it was invented somehow by him and that he, he sort of, you know, made it up or so. But this is the original practice and everybody can do this. You can just sit down and just start having a conversation with yourself like you would be getting to know a new person. Like when you just meet somebody, how do you start? You start with, hi, what's your name? What do you do? Where are you from? You know, and you just start a conversation. You find something common. You say, hey, are you from India? Oh, wow, even I'm from India. You know, from where? And then you're just having a conversation. And so you find interesting things to talk about with your mind. Sounds a little bit crazy, maybe. But it really works. And when we do this, you get in touch with that voice of wisdom in you. And that's really a very, very important practice. It's a key practice. There have been many teachers. Can I use it 
the uh, sorry uh, are you finished yeah Or, yeah yeah go ahead <laughs> not just in relation to this can we use it the other way around that if we hear something from the mind and it's not coming from an equanimous happy place then maybe it's not buddhi that we are talking to yes yes you will f- develop a feel for that with time that the voice of wisdom has a certain quality and like you said it's equanimous when it's not coming from there you will begin to sense that hmm this could be coming from ego and that's what was happening with arjun all along right in the beginning remember these fantastic arguments that he presented there he talked about lineage and traditions and he talked about his gurus and killing them would be a sin and and uh, such such great arguments and he presented them as if that was the greatest wisdom but that was all coming from attachment that was all coming from sorrow and so was that wisdom was that buddhi no that was ego that was ahankara that was chitta all the memories from the past I have a more abstract uh, question on the Bhagavad Gita itself because we very often you mentioned you know there are these opposites um like good and bad or even teacher and student um the Kauravas and the Pandavas so how do we see the Bhagavad Gita then in this in the respect of uh, advaita philosophy it seems to me the Bhagavad Gita is a very dualistic text actually isn't it no not at all not at all it is a fantastic text because as we go along just in this chapter itself in fact in probably the next verse or the verse after it he goes straight to the heart of the matter he goes straight to pure consciousness and so in chapter 2 or let me put it this way in chapter 1 the stage is set for the battle in chapter 2 is the absolute core and the core is advaita he is not talking about duality he's he's talking about advaita right here in this chapter he's saying you are atman he's going to say it in the next couple of verses but it is a beautiful text because it's not just a esoteric intellectual advaitic text where people end up you know like the new advaitas we say oh yeah they do keep saying oh i am atman i am atman they are utterly miserable they 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 have problems they don't acknowledge these problems they are in denial most of the time but they keep using this words i am atman to deny everything that they are going through so this kind of philosophy is self defeating because it is not understood in the right spirit and is not integrated into one's life here in this text he comes down to the fact that yes we are atman but face it you are not quite identified with atman as yet you are identified with all these negative qualities or with all the other qualities or whatever it is that you identified with maybe even your maybe even the sense objects you know you're not even identified at the level of the mind you're further out you just you're just worried about your kingdom and your chariot and you know your your i don't know weapons or whatever it is so which is then very much a dual yes, perspective which is which very dualistic yes so he is very practical and shri krishna begins first now as he will start now he will give it give it give it to him straight you know the core and he says this is what it's about it's about pure consciousness and you are atman and then he proceeds in the next chapters to explain all the different ways one can understand this in a very practical manner very simple things and some very profound things it it was it's quite an amazing text the more i read it the more amazed i get <laughs> All right. So, 
perhaps this is a good place to stop. It's almost uh, an hour and I don't want to go on to the next one because, as I believe, the next one is in fact going to be then um, yeah, it's going to start going into the yes, he starts teaching now the blessed Lord said so he's going to start and he starts bang right there with the wise do not grieve about those who are yet breathing nor about those who have ceased to breathe so he goes straight to the heart of the matter there so best we continue next week with Sri Krishna actually starting with the Bhagavad Gita. Alrighty. So, it was nice having everybody.